Scott, I'm pumped to have you on the podcast, man. It's going to be fun to to get to catch up and and to chat all things, whether it's your life, Society 57, The Orchard. There's there's many ways we can go over the next hour or so here, and it's going to be exciting. Thanks for jumping on. Yeah, of course. Good to be here. Good to see you. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. I was actually thinking about it, and I screenshot this so I could remember. I think it was like back in yeah. August that I had just commented on something on Instagram, basically mm. just said, uh, the work you guys are doing with the orchard has given me hope kind of deconstructed over the last several years. Haven't been going to church, but watching you guys made me think I could potentially find a faith space. Mm. That makes sense. There's updates there. We could definitely talk about, but then I just said, uh, thanks for doing the work you're doing. And you said, and I'll just read one line from what you said can feel like we're lone Rangers. Sometimes <laughs> I'm sure you get it. And that, that vibed with me. So months mm. later when I'm like, I'm going to start up the podcast again like that. I was just, man, I should talk to Scott. Let's get him back on the show. So thanks for stopping by. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so I, the way I've been doing this is I'm thinking of words or themes that I really want to talk about. And then I'm like, who are some people that I know, or at least kind of through other people that I know that that theme kind of rings true in them. And so I wrote down the word like beauty or art. And I think so much of what you post ends up falling into that. The types of spaces you create are very much like about aesthetics and beauty. And so I'm like, I want to start there with you. Some people are going to be unfamiliar with Society 57 and the Orchard. So Give us a snapshot there. We'll probably talk about it throughout the next hour too, but at least so people have yeah. a starting place of what what you're doing and with those things. The Orchard is a 100-year-old church um, that uh, has has been in a state of constant... Uh, I, I think we're like an evolving church, I think is a good way of saying it. So my dad pastored the church like 25 years, asked me to come and help him. Church was struggling. They had just built this big campus. And uh, so I reluctantly said, all right, I'll come. Uh, I'll come for a year. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to do sermons. I don't want to visit people. In the I don't want to do too much pastoral stuff. I want to be like a consultant and I'll work mm. from like, I don't even want an office. I'll work from Starbucks or something, you know, and, uh, quickly realized that, um, geez, this was going to be a big undertaking to change, you know, cause you're not just like slapping on a new logo or, uh, you know, now we're going to wear jeans and be relevant. Like this was about getting into, uh, transitioning people's mindsets, which is really freaking hard work, man. And, uh, so we dove into that world of change. Um, and at that time we were like, all right, let's, let's look at, you know, the, the model of church that everybody seemed to be doing that was emerging was like seeker friendly, big production, all that stuff. And so we started moving that direction, uh, in like about 10, two and a half years. years oh man, that was like longer than that. 2000, uh, 2000, 2002, 2003. Okay. So yeah, yeah. yeah 20 years ago. Yeah. And so, uh, so, you know, we get, we got about two and a half years into it. And my dad, who was 60 years old at the time, and I know, you know, the story, uh, passed away real suddenly at a heart attack. And, yeah. um, they, uh, the church came to me and said, Hey, we, we want you to consider taking this role. And uh, again, with reluctance, I, I finally said, all right, I'll do it. And, um, man, things just kind of like started taking off. And I, I think like a lot of the stuff that my dad and I had set in motion, we just, it just, it just started working, I guess you could say. And hmm. kind of in a really, really ironic way, because the church started blowing up. I mean, we were like running 200 people a weekend. And then, you know, a few months later, like 600 and 800, 1000. And it was just like going like this. And it was weird, because the bigger that it got, the more attention we were getting. And the more people were looking at what we were doing, going, oh, what do you got? You know, how, what's the secret or whatever? I was miserable. Uh, the bigger the church got, I, and cause I started realizing the majority of growth we were having were people who were just leaving churches they weren't happy at and coming to ours. And then of course, bringing with that, all these expectations that were going to be like their last church. So we started dismantling it kind of, you know, it's almost like we worked really hard to get to this place. And by the time we got there, I was already past it and going through theological things. The first time that I was aware of you was right after you decided maybe to like start mm. to dismantle it because they had you come. Yeah. I was doing a like a Bible school thing in Rockford. And yeah. Oh my God. Speak. Yeah. And that yeah. was 
yeah, that was forever ago, like 2011, 2012, something like that. Yeah, but yeah, that, yeah. that was part of potentially why you were there was choosing to make a pivot away from maybe what a lot of other people were doing at the time. Well, you know what? It was like all the, what was happening too, is I was going through a lot of theological shifts that were, you know, were happening, um, which is really hard in that role as a pastor, you know, because people want their pastors to be, I don't know, real certain about all the things. And gosh, you know, when you're like approaching Easter and you're having questions about like, so resurrection and Easter is this, do I even believe this stuff anymore? We started making big shifts. We took, we kind of like, um, stop doing the big show and um people like shows man and they started people started leaving and we just we decided you know what we're going to be um we're going to be a church that's more known for the things we're for than the things that we're against um we're going to be value driven in other words it's not going to be doctrine or theology that's going to unite us we actually want to encourage people from different to, who have different opinions and ideas to be able to come around the table and come together. Um, and so we, we decided, you know, rather than try to build a church and unify a church around a 10 page doctrinal statement, good luck anyway. So values became our thing. And, and we said, all right, you know, you, you don't have to believe exactly how we believe, but you do, you do need to dig the values. If you don't dig the values, you're probably not going to be a great fit. Okay. So I'm breaking in here because I love what Scott just said. And I want to take a second and dive a little bit deeper. You'll know if you've listened to the previous episodes, I do this from time to time where I hear something as I'm going back through and listening to it and I go, I want to just outside of that conversation and that interview, I want to say how it resonated to me. And I like how Scott put it that we want to have people from different opinions and who have different ideas to come together around the same table. And I think that's what the church should be about, but to be completely honest, I don't know how much faith I have that that is happening or could really happen. It's happening in these really small pockets. So I am training myself to see it in another conversation. Maybe Scott and I would go deeper here on this point, because I think you could have an entire podcast episode where you talk about a community gathering around values instead of a 10 page doctrinal statement. I thought I would read for, for all of you, what they actually list on their, their website. You'll know that if you go to a lot of church websites, you'll see a, a long page of beliefs. These are the doctrines that we stick to for the orchard. You see six values and then I'll read what they say under their our beliefs. Cause I thought it was, it was interesting. So goodness and beauty, God is good. Every part of God is good and goodness seeps out of every corner of creation. Grace, because of grace, we believe that failure does not have to be the end of anyone's story. Renewal, Christianity, we live in the light of the future reality and hope for us now, hope for the transformation and shalom of people, cities, and the world. Wholeness, God cares about every part of us emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. So we see it as a primary function of the church to develop people holistically. They have story and generosity. And then under beliefs, it says, We are a faith community that finds our roots in the historic Christian tradition. The way we live out our faith is shaped both by these creeds and our values. We do our best to do all things in love. In in the spirit of the wise counsel of a German theologian, I, I'm not going to gonna butcher his name, but the, they quote him saying, in, es, in essentials, there is unity. In non-essentials, there is liberty. And in all things, there is love. So if you actually go to the like where you would think there would be more doctrinal statements, they just have what I would call a, a poem. And it reads like this. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you're young or old, you are welcome. If you have brown skin, black skin, white skin, or any color skin, you are welcome. If you're married or single, you're welcome. If you're gay or straight, you are welcome. If you're transgender, you're welcome. If you're a man or woman, you're welcome. If you cannot hear or see, you are welcome. If you're sick or well, you are welcome. Happy or sad, you are welcome. Rich or poor. 
powerful or weak, you are welcome. If you believe in God some of the time or none of the time or all of the time, you are welcome. You are welcome here. Come with your gifts, your pain, your hope, your fears. Come with the traditions that have helped you and hurt you. Come with your experiences that have made you and broken you. Come with a mind ready to engage and a heart open to discern. Come and listen for the sacred spirit that calls you to love your neighbor wholeheartedly. Seek justice, create peace, and practice compassion. You are welcome here. So maybe you're in a place where you're going, you don't know what you think about uh, organized faith communities. Maybe you're in a place where you don't trust, uh, you know, organizations more broadly. It, It gets really messy when there's power, right? But there's something so cool about at least seeing people try and having these conversations where you go, okay, well, let's gather around these values. I just wanted to stop and like point that out and sit in it for a minute because I thought that was a really good point. All right, let's jump back into my conversation with Scott. So to make a long story short, we, you know, here we are with this big building that's used like one or two days a week. Really beautiful, comfortable, safe, way far on the edge of town. And what I started sensing was if we're really going to be a part of doing something significant in the city, we need to be in the city. And um, and it just felt odd for me that here we have this building. I mean, I saw our trajectory. I knew we weren't going to to sustain that to to, you know, it's going to be all about how do we keep filling the seats every week with more and more people so that we can keep paying the staff that's growing and growing and add more. It was like, no, we got to do something different. And somehow some crazy, crazy thing. um, We had the opportunity to sell our campus and we did. And, um, you know, there's not like a big market for church buildings. Yeah, seriously. I don't think, but, uh, yeah, we, so we sold our building to a mega church that, that wanted to do like a campus in Aurora. And we had this opportunity to sort of kind of go, okay, what do we want to do now? And we knew we didn't want to just build a church building. So I sat down one day and I started writing in my journal, like, what if let's create a space that's not just used one day a week or two days a week. Let's create a space that's used seven days a week. Yep. And let's not make it a church. Let's not eat. So we started a totally separate entity and uh, um, birthed this place called Society 57, which is a seven day a week social space. Um, We have an event space. We have a specialty coffee shop. We do a lot of pop up events. We do bring a lot of chefs in. We do a lot of innovative cocktail stuff. We do, you know, just again, trying to be on that front end of what's happening. And then the the orchard, the church still is still exists, um, meets at society 57, um, which we've sort of flipped that whole thing upside down now too, Mm -hmm. um, which we can talk about later, but that was a very good contextual, like picture. I'd love to hear like when you're younger, let's say imagining Scott as like a kid, is there a time where you sort of started to realize your love for art or beauty aesthetics of things where you notice like, Oh, I'm probably wired towards this stuff. When did it kind of hit you? Or was there a, a, maybe a moment that stands out? When I first started out doing church work, I, I, someone did this talk on creativity Mm. And I remember hearing that and thinking to myself, I am the, like the least creative person I know. And I, uh, I get emotional thinking about this because it's crazy how we can tell ourselves stories and we can see ourselves in ways that are just completely untrue. And, and sometimes we just need people to call it out of us or, or to like, just help m- remove the debris that's in the way. And, yep. and which that's probably my, Yeah. So, so anyway, I'm at this conference and this guy's talking about creativity and it like hits me and it changed my life. And I I feel like from that moment on, I started seeing the world differently. I started seeing myself differently. I started to actually believe that I had this gift of creativity to, that that everyone has the gift of creativity, you know? Um, did and so anyway, you previously, Scott, that like you weren't creative or was that all internal? You just kind of wished you were or saw other people that were more creative. Like what did, what's the, origin I don't think I really thought made? about it. It wasn't like I, I walked around like feeling like I'm not creative. I just didn't feel like I was yeah. all that creative. It's interesting. Cause I, on my day off, 
I would always read magazines on design and spaces and food and like, oh, I had all these interests and all these, all these things. And I remember at one point stopping and going, what the hell, man, why do I have all these desires? Why do I have so much like energy towards design and spaces and art and all these things? And I, for the life of me, I felt, I almost felt like, what the hell, God, like, why, what am I supposed to do with all this? Are, are these just like desires I have so that I have something to do on my day off? Hmm. Or like when I travel, I might see cool spaces and think that it's cool. Never in a million years, Benji, did I imagine that like my life would actually encompass all of this. I mean, I, I have the best life. I really <laughs> do. I feel that way. I feel so lucky. Like if you could look at like what each, like my day looks like, it's ridiculous. I'll go from like writing a sermon to putting together a cocktail menu to doing a talk on hospitality for you know, like our, our coffee shop staff. And it's just like, what? Wow. I, it blows my mind, honestly. Wow. It blows my okay, mind. Wait. So I, I, I want to yes. call time out there because I want to I want to hear yeah. more of like going from the I'm flipping through magazines moment. And then you have the the church transition. Obviously, you sell. So then it's Society 57 kind of some of that probably gets your wheels turning like all the things it can be. Yeah. But was oh there anything God. intentional happening in between that where you're going from this is all just a dream? Why can't any of it be actualized? to, wow, this is actually going to happen. I mean, or at least in some way, you didn't know from the get-go, but I wonder any key markers that got you from this is totally a dream to this might be actually possible. Well, you know, you have this congregation of people who you get up in front of and you're like, hey, we're going to we're gonna sell the building. And you have some people that were pissed about it. You had some yeah. people who were like, okay. And then you had some people who were just like, all right, I don't know what I feel about this, but we trust God and we'll see kind of where this, where, where he takes this. You got to figure out a place for our people to gather. Um, and so I think like all that pressure starts squeezing all this vision out. It's funny because I think Seth Godin, he talks a lot about resistance and fear uh, in the creative process. And I can look back and I can see moments where I had such an immense amount of resistance and fear in me going back even before we sold the building there was this one time where i decided to have this meeting with another pastor and one of his staff to talk about what if what would it look like to share our building with another church i mean we were desperate we're like let's just yep. lay every option out on the table <laughs> um and and it's not like we had to sell we didn't have to sell it that was the thing we didn't even put it up for sale it never went on the market it was just the way it unfolded. It was kind of crazy. But anyway, I had this meeting with this guy, this pastor. And before this meeting, I had like the biggest panic attack. And I don't know, I, I don't, still to this day don't even know why. But there was something in me like I felt like even in the meeting, my heart was pounding. I was like scared to death. And I think and I wonder if there's not like this part of us that knows when we're on the verge of something really significant. Hmm. And so it's like, I don't know if there becomes this like spirit and ego sort of like are, are reacting or, or at least egos reacting off of yep. what's really happening at some deep level. And, and I can look back over my life and see maybe a, a half a dozen moments when that resistance was so high but shortly after that, there was a major, major uh, shift or, or or something happened that completely changed the course of my life or us as a community or whatever. That's, it's interesting yeah. that you put it that way, because I wonder if this resonates with you. One of the ways I've put sort of that path in my head, just so I can at least recall this and remember it, but I think of it as like courage being a like courage today, boldness tomorrow, confidence someday. And that's mm. sort of how that feels because to me, the first few times that you're hit with a ton of resistance or the first few times you want to say something that you know people might, you know, not be a huge fan of, or you're presenting something that you have vision for, but other people might not see. There's yeah. very much that first there's 
people that present and have a ton of confidence right from the get go, they're, they're probably crazy. Right. So that's, it's just an immense amount of courage. I mean this, and then over time you're noticing things that you're like, Oh, when I feel that resistance and I choose to kind of do it anyway, or I walk into it, I'll have a little bit more boldness now. Like maybe there's something good on the other side of this. Mm-hmm. And then down the road, eventually it's kind of like, eh, it's worked out pretty well when I like, you know, <sighs> So maybe, and it's, you're still doing the courage thing every time, right? You don't get to bypass that, but there's more right. of a confidence because you have a history yeah. of seeing how it works out. And that's really become apparent to me. You just have to get the reps in. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. And, you know, Seth Godin talks about how fear is like a compass mm-hmm. that, that it will point you in the direction that you most need to go. And I think sometimes it's so easy to be focused, especially in, in, in my background, the Christian church back world is fear was this thing. Like there's faith and there's fear and you got to overcome the fear. You got to get rid of the fear. You got to whatever. And I feel like for me, it's been less about trying to get rid of the fear. It's like the more I focus on the fear and try to get rid of it, the, the, the it's actually a distraction probably from what I need to be doing. I think it's Brene Brown. She talks about this conversation she had with fear where she was like, all right, you know what? Fear. First of all, thank you. I, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be alive. You, you know, you, you, you've, you've, you've helped me immensely. Um, you know, and, and it's like, if there was a snag or tooth, uh, snaggle, what is it called? Snaggle tooth, whatever. If there's a tiger coming after me, you're going to let me know. And you're going to, you're going to help me to like make some good decisions in those moments. But right now, all I'm trying to do is create something. I'm just trying to write something. I'm just trying to, so, um, she, but doesn't you're she welcome. Say like something like you can have a seat in the car. You just can't. Yeah. Drive. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's- you can have to sit in the back seat. Mm-hmm. You, you can't drive. You can't be in the driver's seat. I love that, man. It's like. To me, I don't know, man. I I feel like maybe there's even something good about that. The resistance sitting there, the fear sitting there in the background in some way. I think it does point us somewhere. I think if we follow where that resistance is at, usually that means there's something pretty important about to happen or on the other side of that, I think. One of the hard parts with resistance is one they're all, they all have their own uniquenesses to them. When you're creating something, there's a lot of internal. And then when you go to release it into the world, you're like, oh, I, you know, you can feel the, I wonder how other yeah. people feel about this or all those types of things. It's another thing when it happens conversationally. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot mm-hmm. more to be vulnerable with you. Let's step into some fear here. Uh, yeah. My, my journey, which to all of everyone listening, you're not going to hear this every time, but you know, got, this is the beginning. So you got to fill some people in, but I think, uh, this let's go back to COVID, right? So f- for you, it's society 57, right around COVID for me, it was basically like a month before COVID hit the church that I was a part of, we decided to be become LGBTQ affirming. And mm. that basically blew up the church and then COVID happened and then everything went dead silent. Wow. And you're just kind of like, okay, so, you know, we, we know over half the congregation is gone. We, I was managing, (laughs) I was managing our like creative. So I was doing all this social stuff. I have a Dropbox folder that I joke about. It's like, (laughs) <laughs> hundreds of uh screenshots deep in just people that were so angry and yeah right maybe right. that'll be an art project one day or something but it's just <laughs> sitting there i haven't looked at it since uh so but when everything goes silent with covid it's like man i i don't know how almost anyone really feels about this we didn't have all the follow up conversations mm. you you would hope you'd have wow. and, and so yeah. The next time, Scott, that we all got together was the last service we had at our building. So it was like COVID happens. Wow. Everyone wow. dwindles. Most of our messages were getting watched like two, three hundred times. That message, the the first message in that series got watched 30,000 times. So people went wow. crazy over this. And and I went mm. silent, to be honest, like super involved with church plant, the whole deal. And I just, I have been quiet for a few years and it's just in my own kind of, you know, thought process on all of it and evolution and thinking. And so to come out on this side, I think so much of what I'm interested in is 
how people think and how you have some brave conversations and how you say where you kind of actually are on things while holding space for other people. Like, I just think there's so much there that requires courage and bravery, specifically like speaking to the people that have grown up in a community where everyone sort of at least says they think in the same direction and they believe right. we all stand behind certain things, learning to be courageous in your speech and say where you actually are is a it's a it takes quite a bit of time and how do you actually be vulnerable mm. with people that i don't know if if that makes sense but mm -hmm. as you were talking about just that courage and that bravery and we're going there i'm like man that's where i've been learning it the most is actually in conversation how do you say mm. where you actually are and allow other people to and hold mm -hmm. space for each other so wow that's re that's really good that's and that that makes everything so much more human. Hmm. I think, you know, I, I mean, it's so easy to get behind the keyboard or get on social media and state your opinions on on things. And but man, when you can actually sit down and have conversation, I think what I find, I, I don't know if, you know, not on all issues, of course, but we're, we're actually much closer together in the way we think than, than we, we, we really think we are. I think we're closer in, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, I have to ask you though. So did the church shut down that yeah. you, it didn't shut down wow. then it. So it's interesting, like the journey of icon to give it a brief kind of thing. After mm -hmm. I met you in Rockford, uh, I did two years there and then moved with a team of about 12 down to just south of Austin. That church mm. grew from like 12 people in a living room. Very funny the way you were explaining some of the stuff with the orchard. It feels like what happened was we grew pretty fast. We were, I don't know what our total numbers were, but we were doing the whole like trying to be a mega church thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, had big Easter's over a thousand and all that stuff. And then like we got to a certain point where <laughs> I was thinking about stuff. We're having conversations behind the scenes, our senior pastor, he's like going on his whole own journey. And the same, this is what's so funny about what you said. He had an Easter where he talked about his faith kind of like collapsing mm. and he used a jar mm. and like the wow. whole terror, like art of like, it breaks and then you put it yeah, back together. Put it back to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like, that's about a year before the, we actually do the LGBTQ kind of affirming series. And that whole year, there's just conversations behind the scenes. There's all, all the stuff that needs to happen in order to move a group of people in any direction. And like right, who's right, right to lead this should like, should we even have this conversation? All that stuff's happening. So it felt so drawn out. I think the last four or five years, all in some ways, they all blend together because such big things were happening. You don't, you know, anyway. mm -hmm. so wow. wow. when COVID hit, it was supposed to be a starting line. This is a new thing for this community. And really, yeah. in a lot of ways, it ends up being the opposite. I've moved since then, but they continued a lot of transition that we don't have to get in the weeds on. But then they finally kind of, we actually, ended i would say in what december so like two two months ago but it was a completely different community when it finally mm, like shut its mm. doors and was done just because i mean a variety of factors obviously with with covid being online for so long all that stuff it just changed everything wow so and and ha, 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 yeah go ahead yeah go for it no, so yeah, how how old was the church how many years had the church been oh man so that would be when it finally closed its doors was 10 years. Wow. Because it was 20, wow. well, yeah, 2013 started and then basically right before 2023 ended. Hmm. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's a crazy story, bro. It is a crazy story. I'll say that's on a personal, really personal level, I think the, my response, and this is where even having these conversations comes into it, is like, I got so quiet and I, it's because by nature I'm a performer. So my creativity 
comes out, but I, I have had to deal with the background noise in my head every time I create something of how will this be perceived? And if mm. this whole situation with the church has broken anything in me, it's like, I don't care anymore about how I'm perceived. Yes. I've got to lean yes. into like what I actually want to create the conversations I wish actually existed. I've told so many people this already, but I think pain to me at this point, I'm sure this will evolve, but it's almost, it's one of the only entry points into evolution. <laughs> like doubt, something uh, that gives you doubt, something that gives you pain. Those, we want them, we want remedies to that as quick as possible, but I promise oh, yeah. when we sit in them, that's where our minds change. That's where our world opens up. And so those are all the things where I'm like, man, I wish... Wow. I had known that earlier, but I'm glad I know it now. And I invite yeah. anybody who's yeah. in that, like, dude, when you're feeling pain, that's, that's where evolution happens. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> sucks, but it's story, but <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 good grief. You're right about, uh, man, I, I'm a seven on the Enneagram and our thing is sevens is we don't want to feel pain. We want to feel good all the time. Let's just party. Let's just go do the fun things. Let's travel. Let's whatever, you know, let's, let's have a great experience. And then let's, the next one, let's make that one even better. This is why so many sevens are addicts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How can I one up the last one thing? I did? Oh, totally. Oh my God. Right. Right. But yeah, you're right. I think cause co during COVID that's quite a story, by the way, I'm still processing what you just told yeah, me. Sorry. I'm, I'm just like, uh, here you go, man. Have a, have a oh, hit of this. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Let me take a drink now. <laughs> uh, I think I need something other than Topo Chico after that yeah. story. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <laughs> you no, know, uh, geez. Yeah. I, during COVID, you know, so we just come through we, transitioning the church or, you know, g uh, building this, uh, developing this new space in downtown Aurora. And at the same time, I was going through a divorce mm. and married for almost 25 years and uh, the most painful thing I've ever gone through before. And you talk about wanting to hide and wanting just to stay out of the spotlight. And going through divorce sucks. It just sucks. Going through divorce publicly Sucks even more, yeah. but I will say, Publicly, I don't know yeah, how we just sudden, suddenly pastor. got over here on this topic, but mm. I mean, my ex-wife and I, we stood before our church and we, we were in an interim space for, for quite a while while we were developing the space downtown. And we really felt like we need to, we need to tell the church because this had been a long, long journey for her and I, um, yeah, we had walked our family through this, our kids slowly. I mean, it was really slow, maybe too slow. I don't know. We felt like we wanted to share this news with the church before we moved into our space in downtown Aurora. We felt like let this is the place, this, this, this in-between space we're in. This is going to, because no one had any idea, you mm -hmm. know, we, not that we were hiding it either, like we, but we weren't, there's just some things you, you're not going to stand up and talk about until you're ready to talk about it. And especially something like that. And, and, you know, can I pause you there so, for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For Over, sure. There's overlap here. I want to, I want to keep going on this road, but you're pointing out something that's really interesting when this stuff happens where so much needs to happen privately before it ever becomes public, but you're yeah. feeling all of it privately that whole time so the exhaustion level yeah that oh happens God. before you ever even get to say anything about it dude that's making me emotional right now because i don't think people understand that like to get right. to it becoming public is a thousand private conversations and how do we navigate this and how do you try so take there's a release kind of when it goes public but there's also yeah. this exhaustion of we've been essentially answering all the questions you're about to ask for like the last however long. Cause we've had to think yeah. through all this stuff. Yeah. So I just Holy really God. resonate with what oh you were. God. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's well, well said. I, yeah. I mean, and it was, I mean, I have never been, I've never felt so nervous standing up in front of these are, this is the community that I love. These are people I really deeply care about. 
and there's a million things going through your head. We decided like, let's finally just, let's, let's tell the church. So we li literally stood on stage together and we shared our story about where we're at and where we've ended up. And it was a very honoring towards one another. Um, oh man, I'm getting emotional. I haven't really thought about this in a while. Oh. Um, but it, it felt, it did feel like such a huge release. And, and what was crazy was everybody was like shocked. I mean, our fan, no, we had told our family before that. Wouldn't that be something? Um, <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You know, Ooh, a lot that goes special into this. Sunday, know. special Sunday coming up. Invite your, you know, and of course, like it's the Sunday when like there's all these new people. You're like, shit, man, like this is the worst. Like I, it's like, you know what? I'm really sorry if you're visiting today. <laughs> <laughs> this is, we don't normally do things like this. This is a little different. Um, but anyway, yeah, you know, so everybody's like, what? Like their jaws are hitting the floor. And, and so it was like, we had to remember we had already been through so much processing and these people hadn't. And so of course it was going to feel like a shock to them. And, it, and, and so then it's like, now, now we have to walk the church through this to some degree. Yep. And, but I'll tell you, Benji, the thing that, that I can look back at, we hoped and believed that we were creating a community that valued unconditional love and grace and acceptance when you're the pastor you don't always know will will that extend will that be extended to me in my mm. role cuz i you know what i have a bunch of, i have a lot of friends who they got went through divorce they got fired or they had to step down or people were just mean and gossipy and all of that but i will tell you that the the orchard loved us so deeply during that time and the coolest part of it all is my kids watched it. My kids witnessed Christians acting like Christians are supposed to act. And I am so thankful for that because it could have been so different. The grace and the love and the acceptance. And not to say there were people who did leave or whatever, but a lot of times people are already going to leave anyway. They're just looking for the best excuse to go. And that's a pretty good one, I suppose. Hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, 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 it's like, uh, that has changed my life going through that. What, when you're in that, that season of things, cause I mean, even around that time, this is going back to what you had posted on Instagram. Cause you mentioned that, but then there's like, you sold the house that your kids grew up in, you know, you're trying to figure out how to lead the community that you know, and society 57 stuff as, <laughs> you know, as COVID's hitting. So that pressure also causes probably some level of evolution. You could go back further in the story. And when you guys are deciding what you're going to do as a church and there's pressure with like, there's evolution in your thinking. Um, what, what are some of those now with hindsight, looking back, what are things that stick out to you? How have you changed because of the pain? Man, um, or what? Or let me throw off a caveat. This isn't a good. Yeah, yeah. This is not yeah. a good interview because I'm asking you multiple questions at a time. But I also, <laughs> I, right. I feel like it's things that you learned, or even, and this is a lot of the space that I sit in right now is what questions does this allow me to ask? Like, what hmm. am I not sure about anymore? Or what am I not? Because there's something compelling to that too. Pain causes us to ask questions and then feel small. And that's good. Like feeling, all right, I, I realize how little I know and getting that kind of uncomfort allows for growth. So whether it doesn't have to be full formed, like lessons you've learned, if you have questions yeah, yeah. that you started asking, that's great too. Well, you know, look, I, I'm a very, I'm a very hopeful person. Um, very hopeful. And I really believed that I could fix my marriage. I really believed I could figure out how to do this and make it work because I'm pretty good at that stuff. I'm pretty good at coming up with solutions and getting creative and get energized by challenges like that. So I held on so tight and for so long. And someone once said that pain is optional or, or pain, pain, pain is not optional, but suffering is. And I look back and I realized that I was trying to fix something that I had no control over and my refusal to let go was heaping suffering on top of the pain I was going through. Hmm. I remember coming into the, that next year and I always go away and do this little retreat 
by myself at the end of the year where I just process the year. And, and I remember coming into the new year after that going, all right, I want to bring less unnecessary suffering on myself this year. And, um, and so that was a big learning experience for me that, that when we resist, you know, Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about this. When we resist the, the isness of life, as he says, it brings suffering to us. I remember having these, this moment when I was like, you know what? I, I can only see so much right now. My guess is, is that as time goes on later down the road, I'll see more. And, and maybe this will never make sense to me, but, but maybe it will a little bit more. And, and I'll say that over time, with time, as time's gone by, it's certain that certainly has been the case. Um, but I was scared to death, man. Like, wh what does this mean for my, I mean, God, you know, it was, it was a hard road, but the new life I'm experiencing now on the other side of it has happened in ways that I would have never imagined. It's happened faster than I, I would have ever hoped for even. And it's, and, and if anything, what it's done is it's reaffirmed my belief in this thing called resurrection. Hmm. There's a lot of things I'm not sure what I believe about on a lot of levels, but, but man, I, I do truly believe that death, death is not the end. Um, that, that, that there is, there is new life on the other side of, of that. And I'm experiencing it and it's, it blows my mind to be honest with you. It's incredibly humbling and beautiful and still scary sometimes, you know, but yeah, whew, that's so that, a lot, man, a lot. I, I don't know if I resonate with the speed of yours, but I definitely resonate with the resurrection side. And I will say, I think when so much changes, one of the complicated parts, which you're a communicator as well, and we talked about language a little earlier, but it's been really frustrating because I think internally so much has shifted and like, uh, the way I think but I have no words yet. <laughs> mm. I have yeah, no, yeah, yeah. there's something that deeply resonates about what you're saying and about people's pain journey and what happens after and the growth that's experienced there. But as a communicator, I wish I could sum it up and you just can't, you got to get to sit in it and go, man, so much new was birthed from that, but I don't have a way to fully explain. And the, the best way I've been able to say it so far is for a long time, I did sit in, Maybe what you would, you were explaining there is suffering, but then when yeah. you do come out, like the best way I can say it is there's something of childlike wonder maybe is a way of saying it where like, Oh, I, I don't have ways of explaining it. I don't sound sophisticated when I, when you try to talk about the growth, <laughs> I feel super humbled and like very aware of, like I said before, my smallness, but also there is new stuff over here. There is more mm -hmm. to experience over. There's, there's beauty that I wasn't paying attention to over here. And mm. that resonated deeply with what you were saying there is just, you don't necessarily have to have, even though we're on a podcast, you don't necessarily have to have the words to say it. Mm. It's just something that you feel very deeply like, Oh, there's still hope yeah. over here. I think you're right. I think the pain, pain, has it doesn't automatically transform us, but I think it 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 certainly can if if we allow it to. And I think uh, Richard Rohr he 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 has this quote that I've used a million times. People think that like I made this up now because I say it so often. <laughs> but if you don't transform your pain, you will transmit your pain. And man, that's uh, who I still have pain. I'm still healing. I'm still working through some things and I feel like I'm, but I finally, I finally, I feel like I'm finally getting my grounding again in life. And, um, I'm excited for my future. Mm -hmm. it, I wasn't for a long time. I was more scared or just what will my future look like? Will I even have, is, are my best days behind me? You know? Yeah. I'll just tell you one of the things I'm really interested in right now is just values. So, mm. I wondered for you, like, are there, you mentioned it for, for the orchard, like these are the values that really resonate with us and kind of want to get behind. How has that been a, a big deal to you? Like the, the values, 
having something that you're sort of like, this is the direction we're going in. I know that's a little bit of a pivot, but to me, this has mattered so much because I didn't know when kind of a lot of things got stripped away. I was like, what do I actually care about? What am I actually moving towards? What do Mm -hmm. I still, you know, so I, I big proponent of at least thinking through some of that. I'd love to hear from your, your vantage point, like, both as a leader and personally how values have played a piece in, in your, your life and, and how you've developed. Yeah. It's funny for me, like going through the divorce, as I started thinking about my own, my future, you realize, okay, I have this opportunity to sort of have a second chance and an opportunity to reinvent myself. And you also realize that, you know, it's like, for me, it's all on me. I, I, there's no one I can blame it on now anymore. I can't blame it on my marriage sucks or my whatever. It's like, if I don't go and if I don't become the person who I believe I am to be, if I'm not evolving into the person who I believe I have the potential to be, Mm -hmm. it's on me. It's on me. I don't have anybody to blame it on. I'm such a feeler. I'm such a uh, uh, very intuitive. I, I feel my way into decisions more than I yeah. think my way into them. Yep. I feel it in my body. And I go, okay, what, what are the things that are most important to me in my life? What are the things that energize me? What are the things that, because I, I think values are so, and they can change. I think it's okay. Like sometimes we, we refuse to like figure out what our values are because we think, well, once you come up with our values, then that's got to be for our forever thing. Well, I think there's values that have served us at certain points in our lives. And sometimes they do evolve and change and shift. I'm 49 years old. What energizes me now is so different from what it was before. I think now, like I get the greatest amount of joy being, um, how do I say it? Offering my whatever it is I have, my resources, my energy, my whatever talents I have, any of to to utilize for the betterment of other people. In, in other words, like I don't need to be I the days of like I gotta build my thing. I don't really care about that so much anymore. My thing is about building other people, like activating the the phrase I came into this year that was really strong in my heart was was I want this to be a year where I'm I'm really intentional about activating people and activating spaces Hmm. and even just getting those words out of my mouth right now makes me so emotional i don't even know why benji i don't know why but i Hmm. feel it so deeply and and i feel like if, if there's anything i would just give the rest of my life to it's that as a church our values have shifted um we we just sort of added a few new values to our list. Uh, I hate saying it that way. That sounds weird, but, um, hospitality is one interdependence is one Mm. wholeness, goodness, and beauty, uh, humility and curiosity. That's a, that's like two and two and one right there. And goodness and beauty is two and one, I guess. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, Let I think me ask you it. a question on the goodness and beauty one. Why I, yeah, I yeah, understand yeah. the humility and curiosity. I don't think you can genuinely be curious unless you're humble. Uh, but you're not claiming yourself to be humble, but <laughs> they are very <laughs> tied together. Uh, right, 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 right. Goodness and beauty like overlap in your mind. I, I would love for you to explain that because that's not as natural of a connecting for me. Yeah. So that's, that's been a value for a long time. That one, I think what that was birthed out of was a long time ago, we had done these, I might've even shown this when I was in Rockford. This was so many years ago. We went out and did these street interviews and we asked people like, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? Oh, interesting. What do you think of when you hear the word Jesus? And we stood on the street of, in some neighborhood in Chicago. And in the 30 minutes we were filming, we got, we did not get one positive remark when, when, when you ask people, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian, it was like anti this anti gay George Bush at the time, Republican, all the, all these, the kind of the similar things you would, you would hear now, I think. And then we asked the same people, what about when you hear the word Jesus? And they were like, it was all positive, like good, kind, worth, worth imitating, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it was like, okay, what we have here is this huge gap that exists between how people view Jesus and how they view the people who are supposed to be representing him Mm. and sit back as the church, the big C church or whatever it is and go, well, that's their problem. 
but but is it Brian McLaren just came out with this really great book called Do I Stay Christian? Um, I just finished it. Man, I haven't finished it yet, so don't don't say too much. But I won't say. I anything. can't get. I almost like want to skip the first the first part of it because it's so like oh my god, you know. <laughs> He has to yeah. set up to give, if you haven't read it yet, the whole first part is him saying basically why you shouldn't be. Uh, and right. So he's just going into all this immense detail on all the bad that the tradition has done. Which is, I have to say, this is so funny because <laughs> I'm also, I'm reading uh, Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth right now. And oh my God, so good. Richard Rohr, which like I didn't get to it, but I had a quote and I'm glad I didn't use it today because I used it in one of the other episodes I recorded like last week. So people are going to get tired of hearing a few, but <laughs> you bringing them up is hilarious because they're they're recurring uh, people on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I, I swear I quote Richard Rohr so much. I'm like, I am certain that our our congregation is like, all oh, right, OK. But you see, so that that's a good example, just like the goodness and the beauty wanting to bring sort sort of like what the more of what people, I guess, associate with like Jesus rather than what so often Christians are associated with. There's a goodness and a beauty there. And that's that's where you see that overlap. Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, and the idea, too, is that is that, you know, uh, it's so easy to sit around and point out what's wrong with the world. Yeah. It, 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 and and to look at it, point out the flaws and imperfections of people and society and culture. I believe that's like the least compelling thing that we could really be spending our time doing. I, I think mm-hmm. if we can become people who celebrate goodness and beauty, who create goodness and beauty, who affirm it, that's where we can actually be at our best. Love it. I actually want to start to wrap up there because I'll I'll give away kind of one final thing here. But I do see a lot of people that gets stuck for whatever reason in that space where you just, and I feel this on some days, like it too small, too little of a voice, don't know how to change anything. So you kind of, for whatever you, you sideline yourself in some ways uh, Mm. to go, all right, well, I just can't do this anymore. I can't be involved. I think that's sort of what's driven me. The last little bit here is going, all right. After grieving, after looking in and being like, I don't know what to think about church or anything anymore. Values essentially drove me to be like, I still want to be in the conversation. I still like, like there's still something very beautiful. I love that language to try to find the beauty and intentionally seek it out. That's still, I I say it this way. I want to, I want to hopefully tempt people towards hope. Like I love the yeah. idea of tempting people towards goodness, which sounds so odd, but I think conversations do that with like flavor They're Oh, I could see the world that way. Oh, I could try to change my vantage point just a little bit. And so hopefully that's what this is, is kind of doing in the back and forth here. And if you feel like you've gotten to a place and I've, I resonate so deeply with this where just kind of, I don't know. I want to throw the towel in. There is more beyond that where you can still contribute Mm. and there's more layers to go down. That is the hope here is we're not talking about just all the crap. There's life beyond some of that stuff. And so I appreciate your vulnerability, man. I I really do. Uh, I know it can be hard over a screen and when it's like, oh man, haven't talked to Benji in forever. And now we're here and we're talking about your divorce and we're talking about church stuff and all of it. Like there's just a lot, but it's, it, it, man, it's, it, but it's so freeing too. I was just saying to someone the other day, I think that I've had this longing and desire. I know that I have for so long to want to be able to live my life in a way where I can present myself completely and utterly naked in front of this world as I, just as I am. Yeah. Mm. And, and say, take me, take me or leave me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I don't want to grow. It doesn't mean I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Like I, this, but, but I think there is this longing in, in all of us to live our, our most authentic life. And man, for a long time, like when we started, even, I don't know why this popped into my mind, but, but, for a long time, when we started up Society 57, I would almost like hide the fact that I'm a pastor. 
and it was like, I, I, and I felt really torn. Like I had two separate identities, you know, I had, there was Scott, the pastor of the orchard. And then there was Scott, this developer, entrepreneur, creative, whatever. And that created such a conflict in me. Cause that's not a fun way to, I, that, I don't want to live a divided fragmented life, you know? And, and it really, I guess the way it, it really wasn't, it just felt that way to me, but now, man, it's just been, I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm showing up as Scott Hodge. Yeah. And I don't know if it's my age. I don't know if it's just when you, when you go through some really painful things in life, this probably also impacts this. You kind of just start to not give a lot of F's. You know what I mean? You're just like, this is who I am. I like me. Mm -hmm. I like me. I like me. And I'm not afraid to admit I got flaws. I have, I have all kinds of things, man, that I need to work through. But what I long to do, I long to just live and present myself to this world as I am. Part of it has been accepting that for me is like, all right, I, if, if I did the split versions, performing with the mask, whatever you want to call it for so mm -hmm. long, it, it just bubbles up in intuitively because whether it's fear, that's, Oh, this is how you present yourself in this room, yeah. giving yourself grace when you do show up. And you're like, oh, I wasn't my full authentic self and just, oh, I'm going to work on that. Like I've noticed mm -hmm. I've become so much more aware of the little things that mm -hmm. I do to try to gain approval or, yeah, and it, right. it's just like this practice. Like, oh man. I remember <laughs> final story. Uh, my, I went to therapy like two years ago and I, we got to thinking of how I do that. And it was even down to the fact that like I'd pick up a friend in I would be driving somewhere and I could figure out what music would they like. So I would mm. put their music on the stereo so that in some way I'm like appealing to them when they got into the car, like, Oh, we have this thing in common. And I wasn't even thinking about it. You're just jumping through mm -hmm. all these hoops. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's these yeah. little things. And once you're aware of it, you're, Oh, I also do this to present myself better. And I also right. am not being authentic right. there. And so I, it's so funny when my wife listens to this, she's going to be like, Scott said what you always say. <laughs> There's nothing so beautiful about oneness, man. I'm going to show up this one yeah. version of me and I'm going to work really hard to give all that I can in the same way to everyone who knows me. Something so freeing about that, especially for people, if you're listening and you've worked in church for any amount of time, I think that's also something you, those people will probably resonate with that even deeper. It, 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 that's so good, Benji. And, and you know, the funny thing is, is like what you just said, example you gave of like, you're going to pick yeah. somebody up and, uh, <laughs> and, and you're going to put the music on. So you, you could do the act of that can be beautiful too. Okay. Right? It's, it it's like, to me, can. To me, it feels like, oh, that's hospitality mm -hmm. in a way, right? Like I'm anticipating someone's needs. I want to create this really great environment. I mean, that's something I would totally do. But but it all comes down to like motive. Like what's the motive? What's motivating it? Right? Together and, too. And it, so it, is, it, it is. It is. And, it's and, always tied yeah. together. You're gonna, you have to know for yourself where it came from. Cause there could be a time where I pick up Scott in my car and I do it out of a place of hospitality. But totally. there's another time when I'm thinking about a million other things that are just yeah. to impress and oh crap, like what if he doesn't like what I like? And uh, you yeah. just start going. It's subtle, through. right? It's subtle. It's very subtle. Mm. It's subtle, it but if we can pay attention to those and everything. Yeah. Oh my God. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know. Well, I do one thing <laughs> on the podcast that is repetitive. So I have to ask you this before we, we jump off. Uh, basically what I'm calling this is just like a growth gauntlet. And what I mean by that is just like, you give me one sort of challenge. It could be a book to read, a food to try. It could be, I actually have to now figure out a way to find a fire walk. Cause I interviewed <laughs> this awesome lady who did one and she said it was amazing. So I have to do that. Uh, but you just essentially one thing that's maybe been impactful for you and I will do it and I'll report back to you and, and people listening, like, uh, mm. what I thought about mm. it. Oh man, that's a, that's a good, where do you live? I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania now. The other day I went to a Korean spa. Have you ever been to one of these before? Never been to one. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever experienced. Mm. Uh, and I don't know, like if you, 
ever come to Chicago, I will take you to the Korean spa. Okay. And first of all, like you walk in, do you want me to tell you this real quick, what it's like, or do you not want me to say it? I don't know. Should just, I know? Or should I just have to show up and then we'd actually make No, nah, I think you should know okay, because yeah. like you, you, you know, you, you show up and it's like the first thing you do is men go one way, women go another way. And you go into this room that has all these pools. Like you have a cold pool, a warm pool, a hot pool, and you are not allowed to have any clothing on. So it's like, there's wow. just a bunch of naked people walking around men, you know, men are with men, women, women. And, uh, so yeah, well, I won't go there, but, um, yeah. So, (laughs) so you do this whole run wild. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Goodness gracious. Reminded me when I was a kid, my dad would take me to the Y and, and like, there would just be these old men walking around with their junk hanging out all over the place and just be like, good (laughs) Lord, man. Um, but anyway, yeah, so then they have all these immersive um, like sauna experiences. Like there's one room that's all wood. There's one room like wood from Michigan or something crazy. And then there's another room that, that is a salt room. And and, uh, you know, you're you're wearing these. It's like you're in outer space. It's the weirdest thing, but it's so, so great. Wow. And uh, so I, I that would be a great experience. Um, okay, and then they, ha- they have food. They have a, cr- a restaurant in this place, oh, too. So Korean like you're barbecue? doing all that. Yeah, yeah, they do. Told, well, there was not cre- cream barbecue, but there's a lot of other great Korean. stuff. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. It was well, so good. Yeah. yeah but it's, it's just amazing. strange and weird. It's like you're in a different world so i did Korean not see spa. that going there this is my favorite question honestly because it's i get the most random like i and fun stuff and that those are great answers but they're things i would never think about so that's why i asked it which is is perfect well yeah thank you so much for for being on the pod and uh being vulnerable i think at certain times in this i'm just like i kind of forgot where we were recording because i'm just like back and forth and good yeah, good chat sure. but thanks so much scott for for being on here My pleasure, man. Thank you for having me.